my vision for the way things transpire in the future is that, you know, for those people that want to live a life um, of sovereignty that that is aligned with their values and where they maintain some type of agency over their lives, there's going to be places in the world where they can do that. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world. I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Today, we are coming in studio from El Zonte, El Salvador. Thank you to the Bitcoin Beach podcast for allowing me to use their studio. And today I'm going to be having a conversation with an awesome guy. He is actually a friend of mine. He is a high performance coach and also an entrepreneur. And this is Michael Ruiz. Welcome to the show. Zuby, thank you so much for having me. No doubt, man. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So we are here in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. You are currently in the process of relocating to El Salvador. So talk us through the journey. What is going on? Yeah, well, um, first of all, um, I'm from Miami, Florida, right? And um, decided to check out El Salvador a few months ago. Uh, just come here and see what what's happening, see what all the hype is about. And <clears throat> when I came down here, it was just on a whim. And it turned out to be a great time. I came with uh, a buddy of mine. His name is Jordan Herbs. And we explored the country. Um, and what we did was we shot some documentary footage and we thought Bitcoin was going to be the story over here. But it turns out the story was really about the changes that have occurred over the last uh, few years with the policies that Bukele has enacted and the reduction of crime. And so we really got to hear that firsthand from the locals themselves mm. and hear about the changes that actually have happened and the impact that's occurred um, and how it's changed their lives and really liberated the country from a lot of the violence that they were experiencing. And through that, you know, we got invited into people's homes and just fell in love with the country. And I knew that I, I, I had to come back, right? We were, it was just a 10 day journey. And I knew that I, I had to come back and, and experience more of that and, and, and see what was uh, happening on a longer time horizon, um, because I really felt some amazing energy here. And so when I came back, I, um, I was uh, just observing and taking in, you know, the culture and seeing how I can possibly provide value here. Um, you know, I started started having the idea to, you know, develop some type of presence, whether it was a, you know, a small business or something like that. But through that journey, I shared, uh, I, sh I shared what I was seeing on social media. Mm -hmm. And that's when opportunity came to me. And someone asked me, um, my business partner now, he asked if I was interested in opening up a logistics company over here. And I said, well, I have no experience with that, um, but I'll, uh, I'll come check out what your operation, I'll see what you're up to. And I did. And, you know, I saw it as a huge opportunity. First of all, it's a challenge. Uh, I was looking for a new challenge in my life at that time. And the second thing is that uh, I saw it as a way to immediately provide value here uh, in El Salvador. And s instead of just coming here and kind of drifting, mm -hmm. I saw it as a way to just hit the ground running and already providing value to the local community, uh, the Bitcoin community, the expat community, as well as the local Salvadoran community. And so um, I've been pursuing that business here. Um, we've already started serving clients. It's a, it's, a, it's a company that specializes in package forwarding, but we also do custom imports. So, um, and yeah, like I said, it, uh, we're already serving clients. And the name of the company is called Nakamoto Express. And mm -hmm. I'll, I'm going to take it as far as it goes. It's a, it's a fun journey so far. Um, I really like, uh, you know, helping people out here. And and yeah, we'll see how far it goes. That's dope, man. Yeah. So let's, let's rewind a little bit because yeah. we're talking about the here and now. But for people who aren't familiar with you and your story and your background, um, I know that you're from Florida. Yeah. But... Tell us the tell us the story of the last few decades. Sure. Okay. Uh, born and raised in Miami, Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, grew up there in Little Havana during the eighties. And if you know anything of what that was like, that was a cocaine cowboy days, <laughs> and <clears throat> there was a a lot of uh, a lot of violence around me uh, where I was in Little Havana. And so we moved out west to Miami, to West Miami, more suburbia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I grew up over there, single mother household. Um, so I was influenced a lot by my environment, by the Miami culture. Um, got in a lot of trouble, was a little bit of a rebellious kid. Um, Where are your parents from? 
so uh, my mom is from Germany mm-hmm. and my dad is from Honduras. They're both immigrants that came to uh, Miami. And okay. that international perspective uh, really, really helped uh, shape a lot of who I am. I know, Zuby, you have an international background as well from our conversations and, and just hearing you and, and your podcast. Um, and for me, it was the foundation of developing independent thought because luckily for me, I was able to travel to Germany. I was able to travel to Honduras and I was able to experience that culture uh, very early on in my life. And what I realized is that a lot of the narratives that I was hearing uh, didn't match my actual own experiences. Mm. Um, you know, during that time, um, America was like at peak uh, American exceptionalism, right? Okay. And so, th- you know, the, the perspectives that you got of the rest of the world were very much uh, stereotypical. Uh, you know, ger- all the Germans are Nazis. Mm. And, um, you know, Latin America is just a bunch of uh, unsophisticated immigrants and yeah. uh, so forth. And Muslims are savages. It's, and that wasn't my experience at all. You know, I got to in, like interact and integrate with all these cultures. And so that's when I really started questioning uh, mainstream narratives and started really my journey towards f- discovering truth for myself, right? Developing more of a sovereign mindset, becoming an independent thinker, uh, using my own faculties to decipher fact from fiction. And uh, yeah, that put me on a journey to uh, to... Yeah, really, really pursue that. And it, it, in in high school, I was uh, I was the contrarian. I kind of saw the programming already happening, um, and took that into college. I remember being in college and questioning nine uh, eleven the week of, and just saying, "Hey, some of this doesn't add up." And I remember catching a lot of yeah, <laughs> it's not going to make you popular. <laughs> yeah, catching a lot of heat and stuff yeah. like that. But um, yeah, it, it's really that helped me develop thick skin. Helped me really. Um, you know, voice my opinion and not be afraid to go against the grain if 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 I felt like things were were wrong or right. And so I've carried that into my whole life. Um, I got into uh, politics, found the Libertarian Party, mm. uh, discovered you know Peter Schiff and Ron Paul, and um, became a Libertarian activist. Got into local politics. And how long ago was that? I would say that was two thousand eight. That was during okay. the financial collapse. So mm. I, to back up, I. I graduated from Florida State University with an accounting and finance degree. And um, what happened is a year later or a year and a half later, the financial collapse happens, right? And so immediately I'm like, what's going on? I just learned about the Federal Reserve and how, you know, this is not supposed to happen, right? The Fed is there to backstop the economy and make sure that these big shocks don't occur. And so that led me down the rabbit hole. That led me down the, the rabbit hole to really learn what money is, um, how the world works. Um, like I said, I found Ron Paul and, and and Peter Schiff and really developed like a, I guess, a Austrian economic background and in, in from just my own research. Um, but in 2012, became really disillusioned with the political system in America. Mm. I saw what they did to Ron Paul. I saw how corrupt uh, the political system is. Uh, what did they do to Ron Paul? So in the 2012 Republican convention, uh, they were basically tossing his ballots in the trash. And then just how he, he was treated throughout his whole campaign. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also saw how corrupt the media is as well, because I was at some of these events. And when you see the event firsthand and you have firsthand knowledge, and then you see CNN report something completely different, you real and with an agenda, you realize, okay, there's something, there's something nefarious going on, mm-hmm. in my opinion here, right? At least they are not reporting the truth or they have no intention of um, acting with integrity. Um, so that's when I really woke up. See, a lot of what people are experiencing now, uh, and I guess with Donald Trump and COVID and so forth, I was already privy to that early on mm-hmm. in, in uh, you know, 2012, just by experiencing what I saw through the, you know, through politics. Uh, and so I became very disillusioned with politics and just realized that the solutions for uh, the problems that we face as a society or as, as individuals, I don't think are going to come from the political system, right? They're going to come from our own, um, from, our, from, from our own pursuits and uh, from our own activism and, and, and from, you know, living a life that's aligned with our values. And so I, I try to orient myself as much as, uh, as I can towards those values. Um, and that brought me to Bitcoin. Uh, you know, uh, I was, a like I said, I, I studied, uh, money mm-hmm. and then um, 
Bitcoin came along and it was very easy for me to make the leap from mm. gold and silver to Bitcoin. And I basically, that captured my attention for the next, you know, for the next decade until mm. 2020. And then 2020 was the next big wake up call for when me. When did you, when did you discover Bitcoin and start to really understand it? So, um, it was always around, you know, um, during the Ron Paul, okay. uh, campaign. So 2011, 2012, mm. but I would say 2013 is when I really started getting into it and, uh, just rooting for it, you know, and, and being active in the community and, and trying to, um, trying to get local merchants to adopt it and just, you know, spreading the good word, I guess you could say. Yeah. yeah. What drew you into it? So you said that you, you studied money, yep. which most people never really do. Mm -hmm. And then you said that from studying money, that was a sort of direct leap into Bitcoin. So can you talk a little bit more around that? Because I'm aware that the people who listen to this podcast are going to be more clued up than average. But mm. even with that said, a lot of people, most people, no matter what country you're in, don't really spend a lot of time thinking about what money actually is. Mm -hmm. It's just a given. People just think of whatever banknote and currency they're familiar with. It could be dollars, pounds, euros, yen, whatever it may be. And they just think of these numbers and cool, I go to work mm -hmm. and I get a paycheck and then with this money I can buy things. But I don't think most people think very deeply beyond that. And I think that's part of why it's a major reason why a lot of people don't really understand the appeal of something like Bitcoin. So can you just talk a little bit more around that rabbit hole you went into? Yeah. So it started with the creature from Jekyll Island, right? Okay. And it was basically uh, learning about the Federal Reserve and the inception of the Federal Reserve and how it came about and in a very conspiratorial manner. And, you know, from that, you, you, you learn the, the power of money, uh, the power that money has, especially the power to print money, um, how you can create um you know, you can create incentives basically by you know, printing money and distributing it to certain channels through society. So for me, I was able to really see how you know society is being manipulated through all these channels. And um, if the controllers of money are um, not of high moral character or corrupt, right, they can just start distributing that money to all types of nefarious activities the main one being war, right? Mm. And I learned a lot of this from Ron Paul and Peter Schiff and just how, how money works. And so not only that, but, uh, you know, we expend our time and our energy. Um, you know, we, 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 uh, work, all right. We, and from that work, we produce capital and that capital is in the form of money. And if that money can be diluted, it's literally like robbing, you know, your life force from you. And I, mm. I, I realized that early on as well. And this is what really, shocked me really it was yeah. that man we are all um participating in the system that is constantly robbing our life force away it's like th this treadmill that we can never you know get off mm -hmm. um and we're always going to be treading water that's kind of what wh what i realized real real early on and um and then that that's when i started just saying well i'm i'm, I'm going to orient myself away from this system right um and started to get into gold and silver mm. and then again like i think that once you understand the principles of sound money um and you you look at bitcoin uh it's a very easy leap to um to take yeah um and a, a lot of gold bugs haven't done it yet because you know for whatever reason right it could be it, it could be that they just you know they're they've made a bet that they don't want to accept mm. was the wrong bet or, or so, you know, something to that nature. Um, but I think, I think they're going to, a lot of them are going to end up coming, coming around. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if you look at it just from an objective standpoint, when you take the emotion out of it and stuff like that, it's uh, you know, Bitcoin has a lot of those same sound money principles that you find in gold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think the, if I put myself, in that mind frame, I think the two biggest resistances for people who consider themselves gold bugs would be, I think number one is just Lindy effect. Gold mm -hmm. has been around for yeah. millennia, thousands and thousands of years all throughout history, all across the world. Everybody knows what gold is. I think that plays a massive role in people's minds, even if they don't really realize it. Whereas Bitcoin is still in the grand scheme of things, extraordinarily new. Mm -hmm. You know, it's existed for a split second uh, compared to human existence and then i also just think the tangibility 
I think as human beings, there's something that draws us to physical. Like gold is holding a piece of gold, you somewhat feel the value, right? If someone were to like explain to you why gold is special and its value and its properties, you can intellectualize it somewhat. But I think when you just hold a piece of gold or you see gold jewelry and you see the shine and the weight and everything like that, there's something about it that sort of appeals to the base human nature. And I think one advantage that gold has over Bitcoin is that primal feeling in a way, right? Bitcoin's not tangible. Mm -hmm. So on an intellectual level, as you know, I'm much more enthused by Bitcoin than I am by gold. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more cerebral mm -hmm. because it's not like, here, here's a Bitcoin, hold it. You yep. know, like this is what it tangibly is here you can make things out of it you can shape it in different mm -hmm. ways let's craft it into jewelry let's make a ring let's make a chain let's make a bar and put a logo on it i think a lot of that appeal um i think that's one of the reasons why a lot of people like gold just because of yeah that that tangibility and then just how long it's been around for yeah absolutely and i love gold too yeah like, gold I, is cool <laughs> <laughs> so um but yeah that but as far as like trying to escape the the fiat system mm -hmm. the the federal reserve system and so forth i really saw bitcoin as that solution right yeah. um as that way to um because we live in a digital economy now um and it's a global economy and so you know gold has its limitations in that regard but so that's why i really like gravitated towards bitcoin as being this the solution to kind of liberate us from the clutches of the federal reserve and and the debt-based dollar system mm -hmm. you know what do you think that would look like at scale ideally well, you know, this is one of the things that attracted me to El Salvador is the fact that, you know, they're trying to build out a Bitcoin circular economy here. I, I mean, not trying, they are. Um, and so that's a glimpse of what it would look like at scale. Now, you know, I know Bitcoin has its limitations as far as how far it can scale on chain. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, with layer twos, um, the hope is that, you know, we can... Just a moment for someone who doesn't know what that means. Yeah, so the the so I know what it means, but yeah. for someone who doesn't understand on chain layer two, yeah, so the next layer above Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's um, um, so the next protocol layer above Bitcoin. I don't know how 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 other way to explain it. I'm not, I am not technical at yeah, all yeah. with Bitcoin, <laughs> right? I think about Bitcoin conceptually and yeah. philosophically, um, but yeah, it's it's. It's basically the next layer above Bitcoin that lets you uh, uh, transact mm -hmm. without actually uh, inner well without affecting the main protocol mm -hmm. itself, right? And um, and right now we have Lightning that does that, and <clears throat> so you can transact on Lightning uh, without making transactions on the main Bitcoin protocol. And then when you want to settle, that's when you'll make the transaction on the main Bitcoin protocol. So um, yeah, we're seeing a little glimpse of that over mm -hmm. here in El Salvador, and. I'm really interested in that because that's how we get to really avoid the the debt-based dollar system. We get to transact in a, in a money that's honest and fair, that can't be devalued. Um, and that aligns perfectly with my values. And to see what can emerge from an economy that's built on sound money, um, I think that we've had examples of this, like Saifuddin talked about this in his book, The Bitcoin Standard, where you know a lot of the prosperity in which Europe experienced during the Renaissance um, could be directly attributed to their use of sound money. Mm -hmm. And so I see El Salvador here potentially being this um, um, this fertile ground for a new Renaissance to emerge, you know, when people can um, conduct economic activity and, and know that they're doing it on a stable and sound system and that they can keep the fruits of their labor um, into the future right and maintain the purchasing uh, power they have some type of uh yeah stability to build on right they yeah. and that i think can be very powerful for for people um to pursue their personal interests and we get to really see um you know what what people are passionate about come to fruition mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of my idealistic vision here for El Salvador or what I see happening here. But I'm I'm doing it now as well. So yeah. I'm kind of living proof of it. Uh, so are so many people here, right? They've, they've come here to explore their passions and build businesses around Bitcoin. And um, you get to really see 
their their per personality expressed through their work now. Mm. I think one of the um, strange paradoxes of Bitcoin is that I think it's a much easier concept to understand and be sold on mm -hmm. if you are living in a developing country that doesn't have a super stable relatively economy and currency. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the top countries for Bitcoin is Nigeria, mm -hmm. um, which is where my family background is originally from. So, I mean, I know that when my parents were children, they tell me that there was a time where the Naira, the Nigerian currency, was on par. It was of equal value to the British pound. It was one to one. Um, this week, it's 2,000 wow. to one. Um, a few years ago, it was 500 to one, and then it was quickly 800 to one and 1,000 to one. So, you know, or you can look at somewhere like uh, Turkey, where the inflation rate recently has been about 100 you know, about 100%. So each year, the value of the lira is just getting cut in half. And I think that in our countries, in the, you know, the UK and the USA, although inflation is noticeable and people, at least more recently now, you know, feel it and are complaining about it, right? They're seeing the grocery prices going up and the restaurant prices going up and so on. And most people don't really understand the mechanism, but they're seeing it. But it's still, even if it's at 10%, it's still slow enough that it doesn't cause a reaction. It doesn't cause a feeling of instability, right? If your, val if your dollar or your pound is losing 5%, 10%, let's say per year, I know the official headline numbers are lower than that, but realistically, it's probably like 5 to 10%. It's, it's painful, but it's not so painful that looking at the, you know, the volatility a Bitcoin seems like, a, at least short term, it doesn't necessarily seem like a reasonable option, mm -hmm. right? Because someone, if someone is used to dollars or they're used to pounds and then they look at a Bitcoin chart and they, they're just like, no, no, this is way too unstable. This is far too volatile and so on. But if you're from Nigeria, if you're from Turkey, if you're from <laughs> when Zimbabwe was having its hyperinflation, if you're from somewhere with crazy inflation, then comparatively, you're like, oh yeah, actually this makes this makes a lot of sense because in the long term this is more stable and far more inflation proof than our currency. So I think one of the things that makes it ironically harder to kind of sell people in the West on Bitcoin or more economically developed countries is the fact that there are these problems but and they're massive problems with the economy and the money is fundamentally broken but it doesn't feel like it it doesn't it's not severe enough that it's like obvious where the average person is just like oh my gosh i saved i saved ten thousand dollars and now it's worth five thousand dollars in the next year right it's more like i saved ten thousand and now maybe it's worth like nine thousand seven hundred <laughs> it's, yeah. worth, it's worth nine thousand seven hundred and it's like i don't really like that but, eh, it's okay you know kind of shrug there's a yeah it's almost like it needs to be more painful yeah and you know who knows even then i don't know how many people would you know make the connection mm. to sound money as a vehicle to store their wealth i'm not i'm not sold that people would so even with the pain let's yeah. just say because you know what I do think that America is starting to experience the pain of inflation. Um, and I see it with my, my friends and, mm -hmm. and my family. Um, you know, they say inflation is what, two to 6%. I don't know what number. Yeah. More recently, I think they've kind of said like five to eight. Okay. Officially. But, you know, I saw, I saw a, a video the other day where uh, this gentleman went to Costco and he was comparing prices of actual, you know, prices of, food yeah. and and goods that you actually need right the way inflation is calculated i think they they exclude it yeah they exclude <laughs> they, the they most exclude important it. parts <laughs> of of what you need to live out of the out of the basket yeah. um and so yeah some of those things were up 50 percent, 75 percent. some of them have doubled yeah 100 percent. Yeah. and so you know i and i see it too when i go shopping yeah, i true. i really you know, it's, it really becomes apparent just how far the do, uh, the dollar is being devalued mm. uh, just by the prices. You might not see it in your savings. It's corporate because, greed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. So Elizabeth Warren and I'm saying, yeah. Right. Yeah, corporate yeah. Greed. Corporate greed. No, it's more like um, central banking greed, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I uh, 
I think the pain is uh, is already there to make the case for Bitcoin, but we'll, we'll see how that yeah. transpires. Yeah, for sure. And it's it's there. Um, I just think it's a it's a harder sell. It's I don't know. I, I think it's fascinating that in certain countries, because I, I travel a lot, mm -hmm. so you see it with your own eyes. You've obviously got El Salvador, but I mean, I've been to Turkey a couple times mm -hmm. in the last few years, and you know, you see Bitcoin accepted here signs, you see Bitcoin ATMs, you see like you can just be in the city center and you see the presence of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in, I don't know, London or New York or LA, you're not really seeing retailers saying, hey, we accept Bitcoin. You're not seeing a lot of these ATMs and so on. Um, I haven't been to, I actually, you know, I went to Nigeria last year, but I wasn't really around enough to kind of see what the adoption is like and if it's being, being pushed the same way. But yeah, I think it's, uh, what's interesting about it though, is I think it's a massive opportunity for some of these countries that are historically lagging behind economically mm -hmm. to position themselves in a really good place for the upcoming decades. Mm -hmm. I, I see that happening with El Salvador. I think the fact that they are the first mover in making Bitcoin legal tender ahead of every other country in the world, all these countries that are supposed to be more advanced, developed, and so on, I don't think immediately, it's not one of those immediate things, but I think if Bitcoin is going to do what I think Bitcoin is going to do, then 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, they're going to just be in a whole different economic standing because they made the early decision to make this move. And all the we already know what direction every other currency is going in. Yeah. It's a given. Yeah. And I don't think it's just Bitcoin either. I think the move signals something something bigger than that as well, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that we're we're moving to a time and age where um, countries are going to have to start competing for top talent, and Agreed. so, um, and I think we're already starting to see that. And so, by them signaling or by them adopting Bitcoin, they're signaling like, "Hey, we're a forward-thinking country, mm -hmm. and we're going to um, acknowledge your property rights. We're gonna we're going to allow you to uh, save in Bitcoin." Well, you know, we're, we're just going to be we're going to embrace that it's it's not a, more about allowing but it's we're going to embrace mm -hmm. that uh bitcoin is the foundation here for our economy and yeah i think that that's going to so and the fact that bitcoin is going to let's say it's going to do what we all think it's going to do and, and pump you're going to be in a country that has attracted all these you know high talent entrepreneurs uh who are building mm -hmm. um so it's not only that Bitcoin is going to pump, but then the country is also going to be booming. And um, so that's that creates some type of compounding effect, I think. And it's really, I think, going to put uh, El Salvador on the map. Yeah, it really does. I mean, you know, I, I moved to Dubai recently uh -huh. and most of the the big real estate companies in Dubai, they all accept Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You can buy houses, you can buy mansions, you can buy apartments with Bitcoin. Like they accept it mm -hmm. as standard. Mm -hmm. And again, that's known to be a very forward thinking city in many ways. And again, I think that's just a sign of them just, just being ahead of the curve. Like it seems like a really obvious thing to do. I mean, if you sell real estate and you're selling, I don't know, millions, hundreds of millions, billions, dollars, pounds worth of real estate every year, I mean, why, why wouldn't you accept mm -hmm. Bitcoin? It seems really obvious, but I don't know. I, I love the West in many ways and I, I love the UK. I love the US, but I think their complacency in various ways is going to put them in a difficult position in the century. I think that's more true of the UK than the US. I think the UK is just so big and so dynamic and there's so much opportunity that even if certain pockets of it are declining, there's other pockets that are always kind of on the way up. It's just a massive country, whereas in the UK, you know, it's a it's a small island. Mm -hmm. with um, a small island mentality in certain ways. And it's such a legacy country. It's such an old country that it just moves and changes very slowly. Mm -hmm. It's not super conservative in the sense of culture and politics, but it's very conservative in the sense of just like, you know, hey, we've been, you know, we used to run a third of the world, right? We, right? We're, 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 we're the, you know, we're the, we're Great Britain, you know, we're the empire. We yeah. just kind of do what we do. We don't really need to innovate and change things and so on. And everyone will just sort of stay here. And I just don't think that's true. Like, I mean, I'm in Dubai and man, the amount of young British people, the amount of British people in their twenties that are flocking 
to the UAE. Like I'm, I'm like, whoa, that's interesting. And just people coming from all over. And that's a big move, you know, to move from, that's not like just going to Spain. It's like you grew up in Sunderland and London and Southampton and you're coming all the way out to the Middle East, to the desert, mm -hmm. because there's more and better opportunities for you. I mean, I grew up in Saudi Arabia and certainly, I mean, people have been moving to the Gulf countries for, for decades from the West. Mm -hmm. There's always like relatively you know, small numbers and the thought of, I don't know, a 22 year old woman deciding to move from London to Riyadh or to Bahrain or to Qatar, like it was kind of, it was kind of unheard of. Whereas now that's like normal and it's yeah. happening. And all I, I don't, all I see is that accelerating. Yeah. And, um, Dubai is not the only one. There's increasingly cities and countries that are popping up, which are becoming more attractive to people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, so the book, the sovereign individual had a big impact on me and it's big impact on my worldview. And it's mm. basically my thesis right now. And, uh, yeah, the foundation of that book is that, you know, countries are going to, some countries are going to embrace technology to bring prosperity right to uh to their land and to their citizens and some countries are going to embrace technology to bring about tyranny right mm -hmm. and so it's go where you're treated best and i think that we're starting to see the beginning of that happening right now but you know w one of the things that i realize being here as well is just how fast this country turned around el salvador just yes. how fast it is and it's a it's a like a sh glaring example of what can be done when you have strong leadership mm. and that actually made me more optimistic um, as far as, you know, the West or the United States, you know, um, because now it, it's proof. It's proof that, hey, if you have good leadership yeah. and you enact sane policies, like you can create a prosperous society. You don't have to go down this route of, uh, you know, these degenerate policies that are being, <laughs> um, uh, that are being, um, you know, just passed down through the channels and through the institutions, you can actually put a stop to that and you, if, and you can take back your country and create fertile ground for prosperity to, to come back, you know? Yeah. yeah. How would you say your political philosophy has evolved over the last 12 years or so? Yeah. So, um, start off as a libertarian. I, well, let's just say I started off as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, thinking that that was the right choice to make, the moral choice to make because of those evil Republicans, yep. right? <laughs> <laughs> that branding is strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but when I found Ron Paul, I heard him, I heard him on, a, on a debate mm -hmm. and I was like, oh my God, he is articulating all of my intuition, you know, all of what I see. And all, this guy is, you know, he's speaking the truth. And so I thought that whenever someone heard him talk, they're just going to be immediately see the same thing. Cause I thought everyone had my, like my own <laughs> kind of values and my own kind of uh, worldview, but it turned out that was not the case. Um, but yeah, um, got into uh, libertarian philosophy. And then now I'm, I've changed a little bit in the sense that seeing what happened here in El Salvador, right. I realized that strong leadership is, is necessary. There needs to be structure. There needs to be rule of law uh, in order for there to be, um, a foundation for people to live their lives peacefully and build businesses and, and create prosperity. Um, so yeah, I've been kind of going back and forth with this, uh, tug, you know, tug of war between libertarian ideals and kind of, you know, the, the benevolent King idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I, I personally, I, I don't know exactly where I fall on it yet, mm. but you know, I see also what's happening, um, I guess in, with the UAE, right, yes. as well. And so when you have a unified leadership um, that can create policies that have continuity into the future and they can plan and, yeah. and create a vision and execute on that vision and really take the, the country in, in a certain direction, right? Um, now, the flip side is that you hope that they don't use that power for uh, nefarious purposes, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're tied... If the leadership is tied to the well-being of the country, yes. you know, um, then then their incentives are aligned. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would say it's it's evolved a little bit, mm -hmm. but ultimately, I think that the more local that the government can be, the more attached that it is to the jurisdiction in which it governs over. Right. The the more that the people have uh, some some connection to it, 
the better. I'm not locked into any political ideology. I mean, I've had people, you know, Zubi, how do you describe yourself politically, especially in the States? Because, you know, people kind of like to wear their political philosophy or the party they support as a badge of honor. And I've said I've said many times, somewhat jokingly, but also realistically, that I'm a, you know, I'm a conservative in the UK and US. I'm a moderate or liberal in Nigeria. I'm a progressive in Saudi Arabia. And I'm pretty libertarian everywhere. Um, and there's a lot of truth there, you know. And I don't think, again, I've I've been to 40-something countries now. And I also don't believe that every nation can or should have the same government style and laws and policy. I think a lot of people think, well, this is how this is done here. So this should just be sort of exported in the model for the rest of the world. And I'm just like, man, everything from the size of the country to its population, to its demographics, to its problems, to its history, to its culture, to its religious values or lack thereof, all of these things play a massive role. So, for example, even if between the UK and the USA, when it comes to the USA, I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. I think that the Second Amendment should be maintained, and I would encourage all of my American friends to always fight for and maintain that, right? Mm -hmm. I think Americans should have that due to historical reasons, cultural reasons, governmental reasons. Like, there's many reasons why I think it's important, not just to the USA, but for the rest of the world, for the US, to maintain that. Do I think that the UK should adopt it? No. I don't. I don't think they should, and I don't think they could, because there's no historically, there's no precedent for it. There's no appetite for it. The culture, you know, it, it the attitude towards firearms and the right to bear arms in the UK and the USA is totally different. It's interconnected, but it's so divergent. So mm -hmm. I don't think, oh well, this is how they do it in the US. So let's just bring that back to the UK. Something else. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is illegal. Do I think Saudi Arabia should legalize alcohol? No, actually. Mm -hmm. No. They're a Muslim country. They're 99% Islamic. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is absolutely against their religion. They're not going to, it's not going to be a net benefit to their country if they just start, you know, having all these bars and clubs and selling alcohol. Like it's not, what's the benefit to mm -hmm. them, right? Someone can be like, oh, well, they'll be more free. It's like, well, free for what? Free to sin more, mm -hmm. free to go against their religion, free to go against their values, free to have more car accidents and have more domestic violence and all of the problems that come. 100,000 Americans a year die from drinking too much alcohol. Mm -hmm. Why would they Why would they want that? They haven't had it for hundreds and hundreds of years. Why would they suddenly want to adopt that? At the same time, does that mean I think alcohol should be banned in the UK? No, mm -hmm. it can't be. Even if, <laughs> even if you, right, it, it's so embedded in the culture, people are so used to it and so on. So I'm not of the opinion of like, oh, everywhere should just sort of have the same rules and laws. I'm like, no, places are just, places are very different. There's yeah. ways they do things. If you look at the Scandinavian countries um, or Finland, you know, Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, like they're pretty, they're very socialist -y, mm -hmm. right? Certainly by American and British standards, right? Some of them have like tax rates, marginal tax rates well over 50%. But then they, with that includes your all of your schooling, all of your health care, um, your university, right? You don't pay those things out of pocket. That all comes from the, the taxpayer base. They're also more homogenous societies. Socialism is, you know, in the U.S., socialism is like a, you know, a terrible world, right? The word is connected to communism, whereas there they have like just a different idea and ideology and culture and it places are just different. Yeah. You know, places are just different. That's why I don't think it makes sense. I know even some of the lefties in America are like, well, they do this in Denmark, so let's do it here. It's like Denmark is what? Maybe I don't know the number off head. I want to say around 10 million people. USA is like 350 million. Yep. <laughs> and they're giant landmass, all sorts of different people. Like it's not the same. I think it's a huge mistake, yeah, to create blanket policies for different people in different cultures I mean, is basically it I and mean, i see that in the united states as well it's like you know federal government wants to create policies for the the entire nation when florida is very different from california mm -hmm. right and new york is very different from texas and so to think that these policies are going to be beneficial to different people in different uh, geographic regions with different climates and different cultures 
um, I think is, I don't know, you know, I think it's, it's, uh, well, it's idealistic, but it's also very st stupid in my opinion, because you're not taking it into account just how unique we all are. Yeah. 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 And not everything scales. Sometimes yeah. it's just a matter of numbers even. Yeah. Right. If you have a country of 5 million people, okay, let's take China mm -hmm. or India, you know, 1.3 and 1.4 billion people. I haven't been to either of those countries yet. I will visit them at some point. But you cannot govern a country of 1.4 billion people <laughs> the same way you govern a country of 2 million. Mm -hmm. you, it's just, it, it's not going to scale. Like you, you probably need, and you know, I don't even, I can't imagine a country of over a billion people being like, I don't know, like some libertarian paradise yeah, right or so yeah. or even like a liberal paradise like you, you've got to have some if it's going to function it's probably going to need to be more authoritarian yeah in some ways yeah. right it it probably just is i don't think they're just like that because they want to be tyrannical i just think we've just got this many people gigantic landmass you know you've got in one nation like a 10% of the whole world's population, population yeah. and all these like, yeah, you're probably going to just need to be more, you know, ideologically, I might not want to say that or want to think, but it's, you know, it doesn't mean you have to go full communist. Of course not. Yeah. But it, you're going to have more central, you're going to have more centralized power and authority. Otherwise it's just going to splinter off into a, all these different weird factions and you're probably going to end up with more conflict and more turmoil if they didn't do it that way to some extent. Yeah. Well, and this is why there, you know, let's, there's a, a strong push by certain organizations, right. Mm -hmm. To actually um, create the controls to do that. Right. Yeah. The, the CBDCs, um, social credit score, so they can control people and kind of make them, uh, flatten down culture so to say mm. and make everybody homogenous so they're all like basically automatons operating within uh, a system that is completely you know uh surveilled controlled and people and where people lose their autonomy and so you know that that's also a threat that i see happening it is do you know another thing though as you just as you made that point is i've made this point to many people before is that not the top value of most human beings is not freedom and liberty. It's not. And, and I know this for a fact because we tested it. <laughs> yeah. 2020 to 2022, it was tested. Yep. It was tested. And it's interesting. In 2019, I actually had a, a, a tweet go viral, which was had some interesting foresight on it because obviously I didn't know what was going to happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. But I had a tweet, I think September 2019, saying that something like everyone says that they uh, value freedom and liberty, but most people actually prioritize safety and security mm -hmm. um and then everything that played out just played out and even in countries that claim to be very pro freedom very pro liberty very pro human rights you just saw how quickly people were willing to jettison that not even to be safe but to feel it yeah. right people were willing to oh i'm okay <laughs> we're not allowed to go outside anymore okay like we're not allowed to work anymore okay i'm gonna be forcefully uh you know I'm going to be coerced into this injection. I'm going to cover up my face. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to demand that the same thing be forced on all these other people, right? People just say, oh, and then if, if you even brought up that point, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's about, it's about keeping people safe. You know, we don't want grandma to die. Da, da, da. Like if, you know, people kind of had their lines and it was just like, oh, okay, this is interesting because this just reveals people's priorities, not what they say during peacetime, but when stuff hits the fan and when people are actually a little bit scared and agitated, what do they fall into? Then you very quickly see, oh, okay, the percentage of people who truly, truly prioritize liberty is relatively small. It might be 20 to 30% of maybe, the population, maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I'd say in some places it's closer to like one to 5%, depending on the country. I'd say in the US, you'd probably get the highest percentage of that. And I'd say in the US, yeah, probably 20 to 30 in the UK, it might be more like 10 to 15. Um, Canada, Australia, it might be more like 5 to 10. And then, I don't know, somewhere like China, it might only be 1 to 5% of the population that really sort of like cares about that to the degree that they'd, they'd sort of fight for it. And, um, you know. I've kind of come to the conclusion, yeah, that I think the masses and 
they're just going to go along with what whatever the dominant power structure uh, mm -hmm. puts forth. And because, like you said, they prioritize safety and conformity and conformity. Yep. Uh, and so I've I've kind of accepted that yeah. uh, based off what we saw in 2020. And so that's a, it's another major move for me. A reason why I want to make this move down to El Salvador mm -hmm. is because here you're getting a higher percentage of people that uh, value liberty, value freedom, value sovereignty. And to be around those people is a lot better than being around communists. I could tell you that or, or <laughs> communists or conformists. That's yeah. both of those. And so, yeah, I've kind of accepted that is going to play out. But, you know, my vision for the way things transpire in the future is that, you know, for those people that want to live a life um, of sovereignty that that is aligned with their values and um, where they maintain some type of agency over their lives, there's going to be places in the world where they can do that. Yeah. And so, but there's going to be other places where we're going to have 15 minute cities and people are going to love it. Yeah. You know? well, that's, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. I think in this century, people are going to, you know, vote with their feet yeah. more than ever before. There's yeah. going to be all of these options on a city level, on a nation level, on a uh, on a state level. And I think over the course of time, people will just naturally migrate to the places that align with their worldview and their values and where they feel comfortable. And I th actually think that's kind of a good solution. Yeah. To be honest, um, I don't think the idea of trying to force people into, I don't know, force them to be or to stay in places where the culture and the values and the ideology is so opposed to what they stand for and believe in and how they even want to raise their children and their families and all that kind of thing. You, you already see it happening. You're, you're seeing a very light balkanization already in the USA. Mm -hmm. um, and I see it happening more worldwide. And I think that's just going to continue and accelerate. And I think with the rise of remote working, and people not necessarily because why are people in cities to begin with? It's mostly because historically, if you wanted to work in certain injury, sorry, industries and have certain jobs, you had to be, you know, why, why are so many people in London and New York City and Los Angeles and Paris and, you know, Berlin, whatever it's because, OK, this is where the financial industry is or this is where this industry is. So you've got to be here. And that is one positive, perhaps, that has come out of that the last few years, mm -hmm. the sort of acceleration of remote working and the idea of, oh, actually, I could live in this suburb or in this other state or in this other area and I can still work and I can still earn money. And actually, it's better for my family yep. and it's nicer for my children. So I think that's a positive. Yeah. And you mentioned something there, like when, when you're living around people that don't have the same values as you. Um, and there's this tension and the hostility that's always there. I mean, mm. it's also not a healthy way to live. It's not, um, you know, it's not a fulfilling way to live. I, I mean, I see some of it in Florida, but I can imagine in other places of the world where, you know, just sending your kid to school is a fight, yep. you know, to get them, to get them to teach them actual arithmetic and, and, and reading instead they're teaching them, you know, uh, gender studies <laughs> and, and so, so forth. And telling them they're racist. <laughs> yeah, and telling them they're racist for, for, for whatever, yeah. for whatever reason they come up with. But yeah, I mean, imagine having to go into that battle every day yep. versus living around people that have uh, your same values and share your same worldview and your same principles. I mean, it's a, it's a lot more harmonious of a, a way to live life. Yeah. It's yeah. one reason, big reason why I chose Dubai. Massive reason why I chose it because I'm thinking not just for me, mm -hmm. but these days I think a lot about my future family and my future children. And I just think, okay, where I'd rather, you know, I'm a, I'm willing to fight and obviously I'm quite outspoken um, within reason, but I'm generally not a fan. Like, like life is already difficult. Yep. Life is difficult, life is challenging, and we all deal with all sorts of ups and downs and struggles and challenges. And I'm not a big fan of making my life just unnecessarily difficult and complicated and dealing with hostilities that I absolutely don't need to. There's a time and a place for it, but it's just like I don't want to be swimming up, you know, against the current all the time and fighting against the culture. And, you know, things are going this way and I'm trying to go that way and people are pushing this way. And I'm, I'm just like, I don't, you know what? I don't, I'd rather not deal with it. It's why I left the UK in 2021. Yeah. I was just like, you know what? Like, I'm out. Like, I've 
been very vocal on this. I've been fighting. I've been doing my you know day to day private resistance, resistance, resistance. And I'm just like, you know what? Well, I don't want to be doing this. I came to the right. same conclusion. Yeah. I came to the same conclusion during <laughs> during that time. Yeah. I mean, because it was so obvious there that, you know, I was getting ostracized. I was yeah. getting a lot of hate uh, because I was speaking out mm -hmm. uh, against a lot of the tyranny that was happening as well as speaking out against, you know, the vaccines. Uh, and, you know, I was I was receiving uh, scorn from my community yeah. and ostrac <laughs> ostracized and, and, and so forth. And, you know, uh, I realized then and there that, hey, I don't want to deal with, I don't want to, I don't want to live around people like this where I have to fight them every day, where I can't be myself, where I, I can't voice my opinion, where I can't even uh, claim agency or autonomy over my life because, you know, <clears throat> I'll be labeled, as, you know, some type of uh, bigot or, mm -hmm. or grandma killer or something like that. Right. And so, yeah, I, I decided then that I was going to search uh, for, for a life, whether, you know, whether that was living in the woods, uh, you know, in, 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 in the middle of Florida or whether that was, you know, finding a place like here, like in El Salvador, where people are coming that share my values. Uh, I was going to do the hard work to kind of orient myself towards uh, living a life that was just much more in harmony with with who I am and, and my values. Yeah. yeah. What are your goals now that you're here? Uh, so the goals are um, to build out this company, right, to continue to build out Nakamoto Express. Um, but also, you know, one of the things that I want to do and that I've been doing is coaching guys and, and also inspiring guys. Mm. Um, so, Zuby, I reached out to you. I, I want to tell this story. I reached out to you in, uh, yeah, 2021 or 2020 mm -hmm. uh, because I saw the way you were handling the whole hysteria at that time. And you, you were very calm and, and still very positive and optimistic and you were still living your life um, and, and pursuing your goals regardless of external circumstances. And I found that to be uh, very uh, inspirational. And so I reached out to you and that's how we met. And we, we, you were coaching me during that time, yeah. right? And it had a huge impact on me and, and so, changed the tra trajectory of my life. So I thank you very much, Zuby. Um, but yeah, now I'm paying it forward. I'm, you know, so I, I've decided that, hey, I'm going to pursue a life where, you know, I, I live aligned with my values and it's hard. It's not easy. You know, in a lot of ways we've become acclimated to the fiat system, to the, <laughs> to the degeneracy of this modern world, you know? And so I've had habits that I've had to break and getting out of your comfort zone requires a discipline that I didn't have. And so working every day to develop that out, you know, um, I've learned things along the way. And so I've been coaching guys and I want to continue that. And part of that now is also developing content, right? I'm sharing my journey here as an entrepreneur in El Salvador. Um, so I started developing content this year, um, talking about the good, the bad, uh, just the lessons I learned, the mistakes I've made and so forth. So other people can have something to work off of as well. And, you know, I've been receiving a good amount of messages, you know, and I know you, 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 do, you probably receive them every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people thanking me because they're inspired now to go after uh, pursuing a life that's more aligned with who they are. And so I'm going to continue to develop, develop content as well here in El Salvador, where I'm promoting my businesses, promoting uh, the country and promoting my values. Um, so that's another goal. Um, what else do we got? Um, yeah, I would, I would say those are probably my top two goals here. Awesome. Um, continue to network, continue to meet people, continue to try to provide as much value as I can and uh, build a life for myself here. That's dope, man. Yeah. Have you met the president yet? Have not. No, I've okay. gotten retweeted by him, uh, you know, five or six times. Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so uh, I, I think he knows who I am. But yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of, of what he's done here yeah. to the country, obviously. What do you what do you think? Oh, dude, he's 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 brilliant. Yeah. He's brilliant. My 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 uh, girlfriend was saying that I was a uh, fan fanboying the other day. And I was like, you know, what? I actually am because. <laughs> There are very, very, very few world leaders or politicians, generally speaking, that I genuinely admire. And I can look at them and be like, yeah, that guy or that woman, like that person's awesome and courageous and sane and principled and genuinely loves their nation. I mean, I think to be a great leader, you really I'd say, okay, I'd say there are like three simple things that it really takes, but it's it's odd how rare they are. Um, 
number one, courage, two, genuine love of the country and your people, and three, benevolence. It's really rare to find that combo. Yeah. It's really rare. If you just have the first two, you can get a nasty dick. <laughs> you, you, you can, you're right. You can, you can get a Hitler, right? You can get a, okay, you know, super nationalistic and super patriotic and courageous in a weird way mm -hmm. with a very strong vision, but lacking the moral good, lacking the integrity. So willing to do like truly awful things because they think it's going to fulfill their vision or, you know, there've been a lot of leaders like that um, over the years. Some of them have been kings, some of them have been dictators. Um, but then the benevolence, because if you have benevolence, but you don't have courage, it's like, cool, you've got a leader who, you know, they're a nice guy and they have good ideas and whatever, but they lack the will, they lack the courage, right? Someone calls them a fascist and they buckle, yo, you know, like no, someone, someone calls them a name, hey, you know, you're this thing or whatever. And they just buckle, they get, someone writes a nasty article about them and they back away, right? Um, so you need someone who's like, yeah, you can, you know, come at me media, right? Say, say whatever, do whatever, like. I am going to stand by my people. I'm going to make the country better. I'm going to, you know, just continue forward. Um, so, yeah, I think I think he he meets all three of those. And, you know, the fact he's a good speaker, charismatic, whatever, though, that's kind of like the cherry on top. So, you know, um, I think it's good and it's healthy for people always to maintain some degree of skepticism, you know, with any politician, any prime minister, president, whatever it may be. But I think when the incentives are aligned and his success is based on the people being genuinely happy with him, mm -hmm. right? So it's not like a true dictatorship where you have no feedback and it's just anyone who disagrees with you, you know, get rid of that person, get rid of that person. It's like, no, like I'm sure he wants to maintain his 90% approval rating. And the people here are sane enough and on the same page enough, it seems that as long as things continue to improve and it stays safe and the economy is turning around and the cities and developments and areas are getting better and unemployment is decreasing all those type of things why wouldn't you maintain a high approval rating i think that uh guys like us we've been so disillusioned by politicians who are completely misaligned with all three of those things I mentioned, right? We literally have politicians in the UK and US that don't meet a single, mm -hmm. we've got a lot that don't meet a single one of those. They're not courageous, they're cowards. Um, they don't truly love the nation and the people. In fact, sometimes they, they're actually Despise quite openly, yeah. openly hostile yeah. towards it, right? The kind of people who think like, you know, they think the US flag is racist. They think the constitution is some horrible document created by old white men. They want to dismantle the whole system and overthrow capitalism and whatever. They think at least half of the population are like racist. Like they literally say that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how are you going to think half the population of the USA is racist? You're supposed to be a public servant representing the people and you're out there saying like, oh yeah, half the country is, you know, racist, horrible, you know, uneducated idiots, basically. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's just a level of disdain that um that that's crazy. And then benevolence, they they don't have that either. Like these are not people who are like, okay, that's just that's like a genuinely good person. There's a handful. Mm -hmm. There's a handful of people who I'm like, okay, I think that person's actually like a good human being, right? Like they're actually a good person. They're not like corrupted and they're not in this for all the wrong reasons. But um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. Um, I'll be going to the inauguration in a couple of days time. So that's, that'll be cool. Yeah. Um, and I would love to in the future have, you know, President Bukele on this podcast. I'm going to speak that into existence. Right now. <laughs> um, I know he's followed me for a couple of years, so I know I'm on his radar and I know people who work with him. So haven't made it happen yet, but we will in the future. So yeah, uh, yeah I think um, that would be dope. I'd love to ask him some ask him some of these questions. <laughs> yeah, it would be great. You yeah. know, uh, you, you, there you know people have thrown like what ifs at me. What if he turns into a dictator? Or what if this? Or what if that? You know, I tried to not to operate in that. I try to operate based based on what I see right now, the yeah. evidence that exists now. Um, just because you know there have been people in the past that have taken. Um, you know, advantage of the power that they've accumulated to For sure. to carry out their own agenda, mm -hmm. right? Doesn't mean that that applies to him. And if you actually look at what 
policies he's carrying out and so forth. It's like you said, it's like, you know, this is a person that loves his country and has a a forward thinking vision is courageous to carry it out. And so I'm just going to operate based off of that until, yeah. uh, evidence, you know, new evidence changes my mind and mm. not think too much about it and just go full steam ahead and say, Hey, he's sent out the invite for the best and brightest to come to this country and build. Right. And I took that invite serious. Even I wouldn't consider myself the best and brightest, but if I can be here and contribute somehow in some way to that, then, you know, I uh, si sign me up, and yeah. that's why I'm here. So, yeah, I, I'm excited for for what's coming, and it's 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 amazing to be in a country that's on an upward trajectory. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing, and the feeling that you get here is unlike anything else. Like the the people that are coming here to either check things out or to move down here, the energy that they're bringing, the positivity, the optimism. Um, even from the people here, the El Salvadoran people, which are great people. I'm from Honduras. My my dad is from Honduras, so we're, you know, I, my blood is basically tied to this land as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just just great people and um, that energy I have not experienced anywhere else. I don't. I, I, you've traveled quite extensively. Yeah. How, how's your impression been? Yeah, it's. I I'm with you. I. I I think a lot when I'm in a place, I very quickly latch on to what trajectory it's on. Yeah. Not just exactly where it is right now, but what's the trajectory? Is this somewhere that's going to be better or worse three years, five years, 10 years from now? So the reason I, I, I one reason I, another reason I really like UAE, Dubai is because it's upward trajectory. Every time you go there, it's just getting better. The city is literally growing. There's just new things, new developments. It's just it's gone from being a nothing desert to in a matter of decades, you know, I, I can look out the window of my kitchen or my living room and I can see the tallest building in the entire world. And that in itself is quite inspiring. Yeah. Symbolic. Right? It's symbolic, right? Yeah. You're just like, okay, like this is, this is real. Like this shows what can be done. Um, I feel the same just being here for 12 hours, 24 hours. I could feel the, I could feel the trajectory. I could get a sense of the optimism, even just talking to people, Uber drivers, you know, just people in restaurants, whatever it is, you just get a vibe of like, okay, the people here are feeling optimistic about the future. Um, when I go to the UK, I feel the opposite. <laughs> people think, oh, everything's declining. It's not as good now as it used to be. You know, it doesn't matter, London, Birmingham, whatever city is declining. You even go into the center of the town and instead of building like, more shops are closed than the last time you were there. Like, oh, last time I was here, there were, like, I think of, you know, even the town I spend a lot of time in, in the UK, Bournemouth. And I mean, 15, 20 years ago, it was way better than it is now. And that's a shame. It's like every time you go back there, oh, that store's closed now. Oh, that nightclub just closed. Or like, oh, there used to be a whole street of just like bars and clubs and nightclubs. And, and it was like popping all the time. And it's just empty now. It's just empty and quiet and i'm just like gosh this is not a good trajectory the same is happening to a lot of a lot of cities in the uk and there's nothing there's no initiative to turn that around there's nothing that's sort of like coming which is like hey let's let's do something with this land with this space with these buildings let's do something to inspire entrepreneurs the amount of entrepreneurs that are just leaving the country and they're moving to like the amount of so many British people I know who are like the sh sharpest, hardest working, most entrepreneurial minded, most creative, they're all, you know, getting O-1 visas and moving to the USA or they're moving to the Middle East or they're going out to like, I don't know, to Thailand or to somewhere else in Europe or whatever it is. And they're just like, yeah, I don't think this is the best country for for the future. And that is sad. I, I, I'd love to see that. I, I'm not saying this with some type of joy. Like I love the UK and I would love for it to turn around in that sense. I just don't know how it happens. And I think also another part with it is the British mentality compared to the American mentality is just less optimistic overall. It's always been that way. Americans have always just been collectively more optimistic than British people are. If you're a little too optimistic in Britain, people are a bit like, ah, oh, what's wrong with you? You know, there's that kind of that tall poppy syndrome, like you're not meant to fly too high. You're not meant to be too ambitious, whatever. Whereas in the U.S., they embrace that more, right? There's an American dream. There's not a British dream, right? So in America, they still celebrate success a lot more 
than they do in most of Europe. And if you are a go-getter, America is still in, USA is an incredible country to be in um, because of that mentality and because of those opportunities. Um, but yeah, it's a, I, I'm just so, in, I'm really intrigued too. I don't, I don't mind getting older. I'm not, I'm not trying to fast forward my life, but I'm very curious just to see how a lot of these things are going to play out yeah. over the next couple of over the next couple of decades. I think people underestimate how many changes are happening because, by definition, people you know stay around in the same place and see what's around them and see the people around them. So they might hear about things, but they're not traveling around just to get the global picture yeah right unless you're traveling a lot and going to different regions and continents and countries and putting feet on the ground just like i didn't really know what was happening in el salvador until i came here right i can see your videos that you post i can read things on media i can see oh this tweet or this instagram post or whatever it is but it's not until you come to the country yep where you really get the feeling of oh okay i get it i see what's happening here yeah um and my my, my hope here also is that again that el salvador becomes a shining example for the rest of the world follows yeah. says hey look what they're doing we can do that too you know and all of a sudden um you know this this energy starts to spread yeah. uh because it's contagious once you see a country starting to prosper by just you know developing or uh, just adopting certain policies mm -hmm. and taking a um you know forward thinking approach to to governance and and, and life in general uh you know that I think it could potentially like change the world, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, especially now where we have social media and you know information is just uh, it just covers the globe so fast. Um, you know, for other countries, you know they can be inspired as well. Their leadership can be inspired, or even people coming up in those countries who want to be leaders can uh, start to look at you know El Salvador and other countries as examples yeah. of what to do. So, yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. What the world needs right now, and I. I've said it many times is I, I I really don't think that most people and most nations have recovered from this scandemic. I think that 2020 to 2022 period mass caused way more deep damage than most people recognize. Um, and it still affected people's psyches and nations, collective psyches and made there's been there was a lot of demoralization that happened. Um, people became much more pessimistic. People became more divided and more fearful. And it's better now, but there was never any reconciliation. So I believe there's still kind of like an open loop there because there was never any acknowledgement or accountability. Closure. Or reckon there, yeah, there was never any closure. It was just like, you know, Putin moved into Ukraine and everyone just kind of forgot about the COVID thing. And it was a bit like, wait, hey, what about all that? stuff you know the media just moved on the politicians just moved on the citizens and the neighbors who were behaving certain ways towards each other just Dude. moved on right so there's still a lot of that affected me yeah like, it affected me too yeah it I still was, does i was weirded out by that yeah I was like, it still affects me yeah my overall view of humanity has changed i say this is probably one of the most optimistic and positive human beings on this planet um my my worldview shifted not in a positive direction towards it so i'm like okay if i experience that then billions of people around the world have and then of course you have you know the things you can measure you can you know the the economic factors and things like that the inflation but i think just the on the human level on the heart the mind there was just so much damage that was done and i think it's going to take a really long time if ever for it to properly heal and so the main thing I notice now is just sort of a, I don't even think people realize that it's demoralization, but it's there. There's a demoralization. There's an absence of optimism. There's an anger, like a background anger and resentment that's still in people's souls. And yeah. they, don't, they don't always know where to direct it, right? Because they, they, I don't think they themselves even know exactly where it's from. Man, and, that is such a good articulation <laughs> of what I feel too. Yeah, just just in general from society, right? Yeah. It's there's like this collective trauma that hasn't been processed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'd like to have the uh, optimism vaccine. That's the way you know, <laughs> we want to roll out. The, like let's just spread world worldwide. Just like okay, guys, this century, 
all of these nations, all these regions, like this is our goal. We want to be here by 2050, by yeah. 2040, we want to be here and just get people feeling that it's so important. I, th I think one of the most important things for a population to generally feel mm -hmm. and for individuals is that the future will be better than the yeah. present. That's the most, that's the most important thing. Hope. So, you know, that's what you did for me during COVID, oh, right? You, you, you were the optimism <laughs> vaccine. And for a lot of people on Twitter, I yeah. mean, like, you, you I still get people coming up to me. thanking me. Yeah. You yeah. see it all the time. And so I'm trying to do the same thing. Right. Yeah. And by, and that's what I'm trying to project out there. You know, Zuby, you you know, you if you if you remember, like my tweets were very always critical yeah, and angry, and angry <laughs> at what was happening. Yeah. And then I realized, man, you know, like Zuby's out here projecting positivity and it's having an effect on me. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna start projecting positivity out there. I'm gonna start building, I'm gonna start looking towards the future and and, and just making it brighter in my own mind, you know, uh by taking action and, and going after my goals. And I'm gonna project that out there in the world because I know that that energy is contagious. And so yeah, I mean that that is if we all take that responsibility amongst ourselves and start doing that within our own lives, I think things can turn around and change pretty quickly. For sure. And I, cause I've seen the, the effect within myself, you know, and I see it within other people as well. And I seen the impact that you've had. So yeah, yeah the optimism vaccine definitely needs to be distributed <laughs> right now. Right? No doubt, man. Operation warp speed. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Mike, where can people find and follow you online, man? Yeah. So uh, you can check out my, Twitter at S O V mindset. And that's kind of an abbreviation for the sovereign mindset. So you can also go to the sovereign mindset.com. Mm. And so that's where you can check me out. That's pretty much where I'm at all awesome, the time. Man. Yeah. Mike, so good to talk to you, bro. Oh, uh, this was awesome. Zuby, thank you for having me on. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs>